Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mike Martins, Associate Professor of Physics at Case Western Reserve University, uh, and so one of my colleagues. Before coming to, back to Case Western Reserve University, uh, Mike was at Fermilab, where he's dedicated to the understanding and operation of the Tevatron, a proton-antiproton -proton collider, which had been the highest energy particle accelerator in the world until the Large Hadron Collider. But tonight, he's going to tell us about magnetic resonance imaging and where the magnets are in it. Professor Martin. As uh, Glenn mentioned, um, I actually I went to uh, Case and got my PhD at Case um, with Professor Bob Brown, who is still there now, uh, working in magnetic resonance imaging and in particular some of the hardware and magnets. Um, and then as Glenn mentioned, I went off to Fermilab and I spent a lot of time uh, in the control room trying to get the, uh, the Tevatron running. Um, and so as I was trying to think about this talk, I came back to uh, Case uh, in the faculty about six years ago uh, and was trying to think about what aspect of MRI am I going to talk about. Uh, and I decided to talk about sort of most of the stuff I know, which is the hardware part. Um, and I guess there's a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there. I'll tell you a bit about it. But I'm kind of the person, I'm kind of happiest when I'm, I'm there trying to make something work, uh, trying to get the hardware to actually work, the machine to run. Uh, and so my talk is going to be geared a little bit um, toward that angle. As you can see, I'm in the physics department, so I'm not a neurologist or a radiologist. Uh, I do more with um, trying to uh, get things going, I guess. Um, so I want to start out, um, my question is where are the magnets in MRI? Uh, and so I actually want to start out by giving you the answer. Uh, and then we'll talk about how all of these interact together to give us the images uh, that we see. Um, and the answer is there's really uh, four kind of, of uh, magnets that are involved here. Uh, one is the, the big magnet, which is here. Uh, if you've ever been in an MRI and you lay down on the table uh, and they move you into this circular cylindrical bore, uh, that's where the magnet is. That's the big main magnet. Uh, these are very strong magnets. Um, I'll explain how that, that fits in. Uh, but that would be what I would call sort of one magnet, magnet number one. Um, the other one, which you may not think about, is actually the, the magnets in your body. And those come from the, mainly from the protons in your body that are little magnets. Uh, and what we are going to try to do is to use those magnets to get information about the body. Um, the, um, th uh, what I would say then is the third magnetic field uh, is what we call the radio frequency coil here. And this is what we use for two reasons. We use this one to kind of excite the protons so that we have something to measure. And then we also use them to listen to the protons once they're excited. Um, and again, I think this will make more sense as I go along. But that would be the third one. And then we have something in here called gradient coils. Uh, and those are helpful for us to try to get a 3D image um, out of this. Um, I always get the question about these gradient coils. Um, People always ask me, when you go into M an M uh, MRI machine, why is it so loud? Um, so let me just answer that one straight away. Uh, the answer is it's these gradient coils in here. And these gradient coils, they, they're right along the inside of this bore, uh, sort of just, just right outside of where you sit, uh, in, inside the magnet. Uh, and we need to pulse these on and off very rapidly uh, on the order of uh, 100 milliseconds or, or faster. Um, and they have to create a magnetic field, and we do that by driving current through them. Uh, and it turns out if you take a wire and you drive current through it, uh, it exerts a force on that, on that wire. And so basically what we're doing is exerting a force on these wires as we pulse these gradient coils on and off very rapidly, and the force is very loud, or the force is very high, 
Um, and so it's basically banging against the support structure uh, that you have there. So it's kind of like a drum. You're kind of sitting inside uh, a drum, and that's why it's so loud. Um, there's been people trying to figure out how to make it quieter. Uh, it's a very challenging problem. Um, I think if somebody solved that, they would be uh, um, they, they would be well known in the field. It's a very challenging topic. But um, so this gives you the uh, the kind of you know the starting point. Um, and uh, again, I, I want to kind of again talk about magnetic resonance imaging uh, in in more general. Uh, what, what you see here is actually a, uh, an MRI image. It's rotating back and forth. Uh, this shows the heart uh, arteries going up into your brain. Uh, this was done with a, uh, a contrast agent, so this was a special type of MRI where they inject something into your blood. Uh, but as far as the talk goes, um, I want to kind of reverse things from magnetic resonance imaging. And I want to start by telling you about some of the stuff on the imaging side uh, and why, why we like MRI so much, what's so, so great about it. Uh, the resonance part um, sort of be the second part of my talk, uh, which I also might say is, is how does MRI work? And I'm going to uh, explain how it works in, in simple terms uh, using ideas that you are already familiar with. And the last part, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work in particular with the magnets, um, which is what our group does, is try to make these, these powerful magnets. Um, so I'm going to start off here. Uh, this shows here two, two MRI scans. One was the first uh, image of a human, uh, July 1977. Uh, you can see how coarse it is here. Right? It's, this is showing a, a chest cavity. These are the lungs here. Uh, this is the heart, uh, very coarse. This, this scan here took five hours to take. Somebody had to sit still for five hours um, to do that. And then you look at where we are at today, and we can actually get images of, of the beating heart. You can see the heart here beating. Uh, you can see blood flowing through it. Um, so this, this talk, when I was given this talk and saw this, uh, it reminded me of in, uh, when I left in the 90s case to go to Fermilab, I had a chance to go into working in MRI, and I thought at the time, uh, you know, I think MRI is kind of plateauing. I don't know that there's a whole lot more <laughs> that we can do with it, and uh, so I went off to Fermilab. I have no regrets. It was great, but boy, was I wrong about how much more people could do with MRI, and I think it's still, it's still going strong today. Um, so who knows uh, where we'll even be 10 years from now. Um, so uh, here I'm showing an image. This is kind of the typical image uh, radiologists see when you, when you get an MRI. Um, what they usually are looking at are slices. Um, in this case, it's a slice through, through the brain. Um, and what I want to point out here is what we're getting here is an image of the brain. Um, you can see the white matter and dark matter, the, the skull, uh, the skin on the skull. Um, and one of the important things here is that we're not just getting an image, but the contrast on these images, the difference between the black and the white, uh, depends on the different type of tissues. So for instance, gray matter and, and um, uh, white matter will show up at different intensities due to their different tissue properties. Um, the same thing with kind of fat and water, uh, bone. Uh, they all kind of have their characteristic properties. Um, and they all respond differently to MRI. Uh, and the other way to look at it is, in fact, what we do is we design our MRI to take advantage of that. Um, and depending on what we're trying to see, we try to enhance um, certain tissues. Um, uh, so, for example, here's an example from a uh, clinical uh, setting um, where you might go in with a head injury and they want to know how severe, uh, do you have a concussion or not. Um, so again, what they're showing here is uh, the person that's had a head injury. Um, you can see a slice of the brain. This time it's kind of going through, uh, sort of through their, their forehead. Um, and then they... Um, are able to sort of change the way they do the MRI and have some contrast. And you can see 
on this side here, this brighter spot, uh, this brighter edge here, which is showing uh, damage. Uh, we see that in a couple of ways. Sometimes you can see that from blood that's pooling in there. Um, sometimes you can see it later on from tissue that's atrophied. Um, again, because at atrophied tissue has a slightly different property than healthy tissue. Uh, so this is a great example of a diagnostic uh, that you would use going into a hospital. Uh, they use this to look at knees if people have torn tendons. Um, a heart, I showed you an image of a heart, brain, um, neck and spinal injuries. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I'm not going to go through that whole list, but um, it's really, I think nowadays, it's so, it's so prevalent that most hospitals have two or three or even half a dozen MRI scanners, that these are so common now. Um, but, oh, um, uh, so yeah, so indeed, you know, MRI is sort of there um, in one form or another. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about too is not just the anatomy. So what I showed you on the, on the previous slide with the brain here, you could see some of the anatomy, the kind of different tissues that are there. Um, but there's something else we call functional MRI. Uh, and this for me is a really uh, uh, exciting area. Uh, and the idea is, if you start doing an image of a brain, um, and then you ask a person to do a certain task, maybe they look at a video, they listen to music, you ask them to solve a math problem, uh, what happens is that starts to exercise a certain part of the brain. Uh, I think in a similar way that if you ask someone to lift weights, they start exercising certain muscles. Uh, and what happens when you start to exercise part of the brain, it needs more energy. Um, and so you need more glucose to get delivered to that part of the brain, which means that the blood flow increases. So we can, we can see that difference in the blood flow um, in these images. And so we can take an image, say, of someone resting there, then ask them to think about something, uh, and then take another image and see what part of the brains light up. Uh, and I think that's really um, fascinating stuff. Um, sometimes a little scary uh, if they can start to know what I'm thinking. Um, in fact, I, I, I didn't prepare slides for this, but I have seen out there advertisements for no lie MRI, which they claim you, they can tell if you're lying or not, because your brain uses different parts depending on if it's lying. Um, I haven't checked the, the veracity of that claim, but um, somebody believes it's possible. Uh, there's another, another one that says they claim you can tell if you're in love or not, or whether you're just enamored with somebody. So, so I guess, you know, if you're, if you're dating someone and want to know, is this person serious, you can ask them to have an MRI scan. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> prove to me that you love me. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and one of the things I find really uh, exciting, here's one example um, of, of using this functional MRI. Uh, and that is, in this case, this is for um, people investigating ADD or ADHD. Um, and what they show here is a, a kind of a schematic of different um, brains. And what they're comparing to is a control group of, of people who have not been diagnosed with ADD versus uh, a group who has. Um, and what they noticed from this functional MRI is that certain parts of the brain get more or less activated depending on whether or not um, you have ADD. The red parts here are parts that are of the brain that are less activated in patients with ADD. Uh, the blue are ones that are actually um, slightly more uh, activated in ADD. Uh, and what I find, um, for me, exciting, I'm not an expert on ADD or this, but what I find exciting is the idea that we have another tool now to investigate this. Uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about ADD. Is it, is it a real thing? Is it just behavioral problems? Are you just not raising your kid right? Uh, are they having the wrong food? Uh, do they watch too much TV? Um, and for years, all we had to go on was a, a assessment by a clinician that would ask questions about how the child was behaving. Um, and then even if you have ADD, what's causing it? 
And so this kind of research for me is really exciting uh, to see, to help us. You know, I think about it like strep throat. If you, get, if you have strep throat, you go to the doctor, they do a culture, they say, oh, you have strep throat, we know why. Um, with things like uh, mental health and ADD, it's always been a lot trickier. And so there's hope that someday we'll understand the underlying mechanisms better. Um, another um, exciting thing here is uh, what I'm showing here is um, something called a, uh, oops, um, looking at, uh, I don't know why it's not playing again, but um, it, it's looking at the, the brain connections. Um, and what, what we're doing here is looking at something called diffusion. And diffusion means that your brain has blood flowing through it. It has brain, uh, fluids moving along, and we're able to, with MRI sort of track the direction of that flow. Um, and what you see here is a kind of map of, of how, how things are flowing and how the neural nets are all, are all connected up together. Um, and this, this leads to a interesting things like can you see differences between patients with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? Uh, one of the most interesting talks I saw was um, looking at the brains of people who um, are doing drugs, uh, and did that actually alter the, the uh, brain structure? Um, I think that, you know, again, I'm not an expert at it. I think there's some debate about whether the brain structure was different, and that's why people tend to use drugs or vice versa. Um, so I think, again, this is uh, really new stuff, and it's really great. Um, actually, I wish, you know, when I look at this kind of research, uh, what often happens is I look at someone else's research and say, man, that looks so great. Why don't uh, I get into that? And then I talk to the people and they're like, yeah, but it took us two months to get this image and it wasn't right and we had to do it again. And I'm reminded of how, how hard this stuff is. Um, uh, so those are all, all great things. Uh, but next I want to tell you about the most important use of MRI, uh, without a doubt. Um, and that is a watermelon MRI system. And they actually exist. Uh, in Japan, watermelons are really expensive, um, $30, uh, and, and people don't wanna uh, get overripe or um, uh, stale watermelon, so there actually is a, uh, a system where you can, like a kind of conveyor belt system, put your watermelon in, scan it, and then uh, get your seal of approval. Um, so uh, who knows where this stuff is going, um, but that's kind of a, a, a brief uh, overview of some of, the, some of the things that we do um, with that. So I think I'm gonna uh, pause here for uh, questions. Just looking at this, and this is my initial thought, maybe you'll get to it, but I'm wondering if we should get funding for integration and correlation of uh, uh, MRIs and MEG. There's, there's a whole kind of, you know, um, combinations of MRIs, uh, um, one of the things I'm interested in now is, is in um, functional MRI and um, people with epilepsy. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, there, there's, a, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, that, that's another, another possibility. Um, uh, yeah, and getting all these correlations uh, between uh, functional MRI and, and other types of uh, uh, brainwave measurements, um, that, that would be fantastic stuff. Is the watermelon MRI a specific machine designed for that? Uh, can we get that at Giant Eagle? Uh, <laughs> what, I mean, you know, you're gonna spend a million dollars on a watermelon MRI, or is it uh, use double A's or something? It is specific, well, it, I guess it is. It's either specifically designed or it's close enough that somebody's modified it for use. I don't think we use it here in the United States. I don't think we don't care so much. We'll just, you know, buy our watermelon, and if it's not good, just, uh, you know, feed it to the birds and buy another one. But apparently, in Japan, there's a company out there that believes um, this will help them, say, sell watermelons. We had a uh, speaker who was talking uh, over the dinner, and he said that Alzheimer's could not be diagnosed through an MRI. He said the uh, final diagnosis for Alzheimer's took place after death. It was the brain in the bucket that uh, told the tale. 
but some of those scans that you showed look good enough to the point where it should be able to detect the voids and cavities caused by Alzheimer's. I don't know much about that uh, specifically, um, again, since that's not my area of research and I'm not a neurologist. Um, I, I can kind of just tell you anecdotally what I've heard at the conferences that I go to, which is people are really still trying to, to use this as a, a research tool. And I've seen some people um, kind of relate it to research and have some ideas, but I haven't personally seen anybody uh, proposing it for a clinical uh, diagnostic at this point. Uh, may maybe it's out there, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. I'm claustrophobic, and is there any way that you could reverse the body going into the tube instead of putting them in head first? Yeah, there are people who, who do that. There are things called open MRI systems. That's built different. It's built different, yes. Um, but for the, for the ones that are, that are the sort of standard ones that you see mostly where you go into, into the bore, uh, you really need the part of you that's imaged to be very near the center of that bore. You need to be very near a part of the magnetic field that's very uniform. And as you move out towards the edge, you start to get changes in the, in the magnetic field. There's a fringe field. Uh, and it's, it, you, it, that will distort your image. So uh, unfortunately, there isn't much you can do for that. Uh, the people are trying. They're trying to make the magnet shorter or bigger or, or open MRI. Um, but it turns out the ones that you typically see are the ones that work the best. What's the difference between a functional MRI and a PET scan? So in a, a PET scan, um, that's, PET stands for uh, positron emission tomography. Uh, and the idea there is that you, you will usually be um, injected with some kind of uh, radioactive material, um, which is connected to some kind of molecule. And th they'll inject that into you and then let that molecule um, uh, sort of pool into certain parts of the body, de depending on what they're looking for. For instance, if they're looking for cancer, they'll put something that tends to um, uh, connect with cancer. And then what they're looking for is, are the radioactive decays. Uh, and then they can see where each radioactive decay comes from. And then they add that up over a, a, a long amount of time and do a reconstruction to show you which parts um, of your body have most of this radiation. Uh, the radiation is, you know, it's, it's fairly small, but it's not insignificant. But it, um, uh, the advantage of that over MRI um, is you can have a certain type of molecule that you can inject and you can kind of target certain tissue types like cancer that you're interested in. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Mike Martins discussing the early days of magnetic resonance imaging. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Martins discusses how MRI works by exciting atomic nuclei to oscillate in a large magnetic field. Now, back to the talk. So that was the, uh, the sort of the first part of the talk, the imaging. Uh, the second part uh, here is, um, I'll use the word resonance, but what I really mean here is how MRI works. Uh, and since I'm a physicist and work on the hardware, this is a lot of, of what I do. Um, and I'm going to, to explain it um, in, in concepts that are familiar to you already. Uh, I'm not going to get deeply involved in mathematics or, or anything like that. Um, but these are some of the concepts here that um, I'll be using as I try to explain this. Uh, a gyroscope, for instance, you're all familiar with the, the, the toy gyroscope, uh, which you start it spinning, uh, and then instead of toppling over, it, it precesses around. Uh, magnets are something you're familiar with. You know that um, you can have a magnet and then you can't see it, but there's a magnetic field out there which will attract things like nails. Um, a compass is another one, obviously, um, that will react um, with the Earth's magnetic field, for instance, and help you tell north from south. Um, a piano, that one will be a little more obvious as we go along, um, but I have a way to relate it. And the ear. Um, and in this case, by ear, I mean a listening device, something that you can listen with. Um, so these are kind of concepts that um, 
you're familiar with. I do have to introduce a couple of, of new, new concepts, but they're, they're pretty simple to understand. Um, but let me um, sort of start with this picture first. So this is, uh, again, the idea I'm sure you're familiar with, with a compass. And the idea is the Earth is a, is a giant magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. Uh, and you can see these lines here uh, represent the, the path of the magnetic field. And then if you have a compass and you put the compass anywhere, it's going to line up with the magnetic field. And so the idea is we can use these tiny little magnets, these compasses, to help us map out uh, the Earth's magnetic field and to figure out what is the big magnet doing. For MRI, we're going to try to do it in reverse. We're going to have this big magnet that you go into, uh, and we're going to try to use that to help us understand what's happening with the little magnets in your body. And those little magnets are the protons. Uh, and it, it turns out the proton uh, has an actual a little magnetic moment. It acts like a little magnet. Um, so here we have a kind of schematic of a, a magnet. And if I had a proton here, it would also uh, look like a little magnet or have a magnetic field. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, this is the, uh, this is the smallest uh, magnets we have. Um, and so you can see already, if I have a magnet and I'm talking about compasses, uh, how this is going to start to um, act inside a magnetic field. But there's another really important part of this, and that is the proton also has a spin. Uh, so it has some uh, uh, what we call angular momentum. It has something like the gyroscope uh, that is spinning, and it has a part of it that is spinning. And so when this is in a magnetic field, it's not going to act quite like a compass. A compass kind of swings back and forth, and then will kind of sort of um, line up with the, with the magnetic field. Uh, but because of this spin, it's going to act more like a gyroscope. And we're going to take advantage of that feature uh, when we do MRI. Um, another concept uh, that's really important here is something called Faraday's Law. Uh, and the idea here is, um, imagine I have a loop of wire here uh, connected up to a light bulb. And what I have here is a, a magnet that's rotating. Um, and what's happening as this magnet is rotating, the magnetic field that's going through this coil here is changing. So in this case, because I have a, a magnet that's rotating, it's, it's oscillating back and forth. And Faraday's law says that if I have a magnetic <clears throat> field that's changing in this loop, it's going to create a voltage. And so what you're seeing here uh, with this animation uh, is you see the light bulb going on and off as it's reacting to this spinning magnet here. Um, and you can do things like, oh, it's not going to work on this one. But uh, if this magnet was spinning faster, for instance, uh, the light bulb would be going on and off faster. Um, and so, in a sense, this is going to be like my ear, that I'm going to listen for uh, magnets that are spinning. And what I'm going to be able to tell is, one, how fast they're spinning, and two, how big the magnet is. The bigger the magnet, the brighter the light, um, and then the frequency of it going on and off is telling me how fast that it's spinning. Um, and then the third thing uh, is the precession frequency. Uh, so this shows here a top that somebody has spun up and then set down. And again, instead of the top just flopping right down to the ground, um, because it's spinning, it will precess. And it's going to precess around uh, the direction of gravity. So in this case, gravity is up and down. Um, uh, so let me play that again. And so this is related to the proton, I said, like the proton is similar to this. If this wasn't, if the proton wasn't spinning, it would just sort of line up with gravity um, like this would. But because it's spinning, it's going to precess around. And that precession, if I go back to my previous one, is going to cause a, a magnet that's rotating. And then if we can um, pick that up with this coil, then we can start to get an idea of what uh, the protons are doing in our body. Um, 
So that's kind of, kind of the main idea. Um, and another thing that we need to know, um, well, this is supposed to be the spinning top again, but uh, if I think about a top that spins, and I think about the precession frequency, um, that actually depends on how strong gravity is. So if I took a top and I went to the moon and started the top and spinning, it would, it would have a slower precession frequency. Uh, and the same thing applies with our proton. If I put a proton into a stronger magnetic field, it's going to precess faster. If I put it into a weaker field, it's going to precess slower. Uh, so the idea is I have this, this resonant frequency now um, that is determined by the proton and the magnetic field it's in. And, and this is where I'm going to relate it to a piano. Uh, and the idea, if I play a note on a piano, uh, you know, I can, I can tell what note it is, I can hear it. It's the same way with the proton spinning in a magnetic field and me listening to it with that, that coil. Uh, just like my ear can pick up what frequency or what note the piano is playing, that, that coil can pick up what frequency the, the proton is. Um, so if I go back, now that I, we've got these kind of basic ideas of a gyroscope and the proton acting like a gyroscope uh, in a magnetic field, uh, we can kind of see how all these magnets will uh, fit together to give us an image. Uh, so we have the main magnetic field here, uh, and that's, that's the one you go into, and that's a strong one, and what that will tend to do is try to align the protons up, similar to, to a compass, um, and eventually once things settle down, you'll sort of get an average of the protons pointing in the same direction as the magnetic field. So that's kind of, kind of step one, is to use this magnet from the MRI to kind of align the little magnets in your body. Uh, then we use the, the radio frequency coil. Uh, and what we do is we use that in a resonant, resonating way. And we drive the RF coil at the same frequency that the protons would precess. And if we have the frequency just right, we can excite those spins and have them go from a kind of resting state along the uh, magnetic field, and we can kind of move them to their perpendicular to the magnetic field, and then they start to precess around, and that's what we can measure. So the RF coil here is, again, like another one of the magnets. Um, we use those to excite the spin, and then we also use that same coil to listen to the spin um, by seeing what kind of frequency. Um, now, that's all great, but if you put a person in a uniform field, and did that, all the protons would be spinning at the same frequency. It would be like having a piano with only one note. Uh, um, but what I can do, oh, yeah, this is, I meant to say this, I'm talking about um, uh, this magnetic field and how strong it is. Uh, this is um, an example of how strong that, that magnetic field is. It's, um, 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla, which is about 10,000 times the strength of the Earth on the magnetic field. Uh, it's enough, you, you can see here a gurney that wasn't supposed to be put in to the room is literally sucked off the floor by the magnetic force. Um, and uh, this is, you know, this is, um, I, I, I sort of love seeing this stuff because it's kind of cool. But it is a really serious um, issue with safety as well, um, because if somebody rolls you in with the wrong thing, if they roll you on in a wheelchair or they bring an oxygen um, tank in there, or if you have metal in your body, uh, and so this is actually a, um, it's kind of one of those things where it's, it's really cool when it's just a gurney smashing in there. Um, but also, if you've ever gotten an MRI, you probably feel like you've been asked a thousand times, do you have any metal in your body? Have you had any surgeries? And you're probably like, why do they keep asking me this? Uh, my wife is a nurse who works in MRI, and, and the reason is they want to be darn sure they don't put someone in there who has some metal within them. Um, so that gives you an idea that these magnets are not your garden variety refrigerator magnets. These are really, really powerful. Um, so now what I want to do, I kind of want to put, put everything together. Uh, and what I've shown here is a kind of 
a, a sketch of uh, a person lying in an MRI. Here's the big magnet here. Uh, the big magnet will um, create a magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is pointing in the direction from the person's feet to the head, the way I drew it here. Uh, and it's this magnetic field here in blue, which is going to tend to align all the little magnets, all the protons in your body. Uh, and we start, we start with that. Uh, and then we have this RF coil here. And as I mentioned, the RF coil is going to be used to tip the spins. Uh, for some reason, my animation isn't working here. But the spins would start being aligned along this direction here. And then if you have the right resonance, they get so that they're pointing uh, sort of up and down and precessing. Uh, so there, all, the, all the protons here now would be, would be spinning. Um, and then I could, quote, listen to them with the RF coil. But now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add um, another field, and that's a gradient coil. These are the ones I mentioned that make all the noise. Um, and what the gradient coil does is make the magnetic field slightly stronger on one end. And the way I drew it here, it's in the head, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and slightly weaker at the other part of your body. Um, so now I have these protons that are precessing. Uh, and remember, the, the speed of the precession is going to depend on the strength of the magnetic field. So now the protons in your head, in this sketch here, because they're in a region where the magnetic field is slightly higher, are going to be spinning slightly faster. Uh, the ones over here, down by your legs, because they are in a magnetic field that's slightly weaker, are going to spin a little bit slower. And now if I listen to that, quote, quote listen to that with the RF coil, uh, because these are spinning not at sounds that we can hear, but at megahertz. Uh, they're, they're more the frequencies of radio stations than pianos. But the idea still, still applies. And if I think about piano keys, and imagine I have a piano up here, and I press a note down, and you can hear it. You'll say, oh, that's a, that's a middle C. And you know how the, how the, the piano is. And you'll know that, oh, I must have hit that key right here. If I hit one over here that's at a higher pitch, you'll hear that, and you'll be, oh, that's a high note. He must be pressing something over on this side. A low note would be me pressing something here. And so now you, by listening to the sound, listening to the note, uh, and knowing the piano, you can tell which, which keys are being pushed. Um, and also by the sound, by the, the uh, strength of the sound, you can tell how loud they are being pushed. So, so the idea is this is similar to a piano now, where I have each position in my body uh, is spinning at a different frequency. It's like each position in my body is a different note. And depending on how many spins are in that part of the body will determine the strength. So what I can do now is, quote, listen, just like you would listen to a piano. And uh, you could tell which notes are being pressed and how hard. And so now you have this idea of converting from sound to a, a location on the keyboard. Oh, excuse me. And um, that's the same, the same thing here. We're, we're converting uh, how fast something is, is spinning to a position. So now you can start to see how we're going to start to do imaging. Um, and it turns out, uh, I won't go through this part, but by, by using a set of three gradient coils, one in each direction, I'd use one going along this way, one from the person's back to the top, uh, and another one from left to right, and doing these in the, in the right combination, um, I can get a three-dimensional picture of, of the body and how many spins there are in each little uh, portion of the body. So that's kind of um, uh, the, the way it works. Um, uh, again, to actually get this going um, mathematically and that is, uh, takes a while. But the idea is actually fairly simple. The, ex the idea is, um, is fairly simple. Um, so just to go through it one more time, the, the, the sequence is you have this big main magnet. 
Uh, you put somebody in the magnet and the, the little protons align uh, with that magnet. You use a RF coil to tip the magnets. Uh, they start to spin. They start to precess. Uh, you add a gradient to it so that the frequency of the precession depends on where that spin is located. Then you quote listen for the proton spinning. Uh, and then if you use a combination of three gradient coils, you get a uh, 3D image. Um, so I think I'll stop here um, for uh, this part. Um, let's see if you have any more questions and see how I'm doing on time here. On your image of the brain in the last section, when you um, had, I think it was with the concussed person, at the bottom, there was um, the colors. Uh, yeah. And what do those colors indicate for, and is that from the MRI, or is that something added from information you got from the MRI? Usually the way uh, things are still done is radiologists usually are used to looking at these slices. And, and you can sort of see slice anywhere you want through the brain and at any angle. You can look at a slice going this way, going through you this way. Um, and that's just kind of the way that th they've done it. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in, in trying to take all this three-dimensional data and, and turn it into a three-dimensional image to help, um, help radiologists and doctors see what's going on. And so this particular one uh, here, was taken from the MRI data, um, but instead of it sort of just showing it in black and white and different slices, uh, what it was showing you is on the surface of the brain uh, what the different um, signal was. And you could see here uh, the difference between the left and the right showing the bruising on the right. Um, so I think this is, uh, um, I, last, last week, Mark Gris Griswold was here talking about um, holography and anatomy, and one of the things that got him interested in what he was doing is, is we're doing this great three-dimensional imaging, but we still tend to look at it like a doctor would an x-ray, sort of the old-fashioned way, and, and there's got to be a better way, because we really have three-dimensional information, and, and we have great graphics to show it, so this is kind of, I think, where we're moving. Are the protons different uh, uh, in different parts of the tissue, or different among different tissues? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, now, the protons themselves aren't different. Uh, all protons are are exactly the same. Uh, what is different is the way that the protons interact with the molecules um, that they're in, um, and and the tissue that they're in. So, if I go back to um, my idea here of the, the gyroscope, um, uh, all, pro, all gyroscopes would kind of do, do the same thing, but what you notice here is that it's decaying, right? I start off with, with spinning it and it will stand upright, but as it starts to lose energy, it will start to um, uh, decay, right, until it sort of comes to rest. And a similar thing happens with the protons that we start them precessing, um, but some of them will start to relax back to pointing with the magnetic field faster than others. And the rate at which those relax is not dependent on the proton, it's dependent on the tissue and how much that proton interacts with the tissue. Um, another kind of related concept is the idea of that you're um, the molecules and stuff have very small magnetic um, properties as well, and that small magnet will add to the magnetic field you use on the protons, and they will spin at slightly different rates for that reason, which adds, adds to the, to the comp, comp, um, complexity of getting a, a good image. But it's really that interaction between the proton and the surrounding tissue which is different. Um, and we can... We can um, tell a lot about what kind of tissue it is by how fast that decays. Should we get funding for integration of uh, holography with the outputs of MRIs? Oh, absolutely, yes. And I'd be happy to take some of that funding, yes. <laughs> Will two different MRI machines produce the same results? There's actually some debate about that, about how, 
how um, well calibrated they are with each other. Um, they do in, se in the sense, I think, that if you're looking at contrast and you're looking at the difference between, say, d um, uh, you know, gray matter and white matter in the brain, uh, that you both could see the same difference and you both machines would pick up a tumor. But in terms of an actual number of, of the strength of the signal, um, those can differ from, from machine to machine. If this is the case, will it lend itself to artificial intelligence of interpreting uh, MRI results? The way artificial intelligence is going, I'm sure that <laughs> somebody's probably already trying that, if, if, um, um, if not. But there, there, there are, uh, I'll, mo I'll move on from here, but there are a lot of standards that they try to use the same, the same phantom, they call it, and put it in different MRI machines to, to see how well they're all calibrated. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Mike Martins. Dr. Martins spent several years at Fermilab, the principal U.S. particle physics laboratory, where he was one of the people who ran the Tevatron, long the most powerful particle accelerator in the world. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the physics of MRI. In our final segment, Dr. Martins will talk about the magnets that make MRI possible and his work to make them better, smaller, and cheaper. Now, back to our talk. The last section here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about my own research and what I focus on, and that's the magnets for the MRI. And these are the big, big magnets that I mentioned. Um, and uh, what I show here is a kind of a cartoon of a, a magnet. Um, and what, what this shows here is we have a bunch of coils, um, and each of these red coils here is really a bunch of wires wrapped around the coil, and then you run a current through that um, coil to make a magnetic field. Uh, what you see here, too, that's important is not just that we want to get a strong magnetic field, but we also want to get one that's very uniform within this region where you're imaging. Uh, in fact, over the imaging volume, say from the, the front of your chest to your back, um, we want the magnetic field to change by less than 10 parts per million. So it's a vi not only very strong, but it has to be a very uniform, and that makes life challenging. We can't just make a big magnet. It has to be big and very uniform. Uh, and that's some of the work that we do, is try to figure out exactly where to place these coils, how many wires to round, wound, wind around each one. Uh, this here just shows a picture of an uh, actual kind of um, coil, what it would look like physically before it's put in into the machine. Uh, and you can see here the different cylinders with the, um, the wires. Um, now, if you tried to do this with, say, regular copper wire, you go to the hardware store and you get copper wire and you, you wind it, um, the problem is that the copper wire has a, a resistance and if you run current through that, it will start to heat up. Um, you can kind of think about a light bulb, for instance. The old-fashioned light bulbs, um, uh, I don't know if my daughter will recognize this analogy um, now with LEDs and everything, but the old kind, they would get really hot when you, when you ran current through them. Um, and if you tried to make a magnet with copper and run the currents you, through it, you've basically made a giant toaster. Uh, because you're trying to, to heat this, or you're trying to run current through this, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's just gonna put a lot of heat into that wire. In fact, it, it would take about five megawatts to, to operate a, a, a magnet with just copper, which I, I think I did the math, I think that's about 1,000 households or, or maybe more, so it's a lot. And, and this thing would just heat up and, and you wouldn't be able to operate it. It would just get, get too hot. Um, uh, however, there is this great material called a superconductor, uh, which comes to our rescue. And a superconductor is uh, a special kind of material which doesn't have any electrical resistance. So you can put a lot of current through it without any resistance. Or another way to say it is you can put a lot of current through it and it doesn't heat up. Uh, and so you're not, 
you're not heating up the, up the magnet. Um, to do that, what, whoops, um, what, uh, I don't know why this isn't playing. Um, well, let me, I'll come back to that maybe if I have time. Uh, what this video is supposed to show, though, is this piece of superconductor here. This is a little magnet. Uh, and if you take the magnet and you set it on top of the, of the superconductor, it would just, it would just fall down uh, right on top and, and do nothing special at room temperature. But if I cool it down, uh, and in this case, suppose I poured liquid nitrogen over it and I cooled it way down to low temperatures, it will start becoming superconducting, and what would happen is the magnet would start to, to levitate above the superconductor. Um, and that's um, a similar uh, phenomena that's related to this idea of superconducting. If I have the right material and I can cool it down cold enough, I can start putting current through it without heating up the wire. Uh, and that's a great, great feature for these strong magnets and, and large currents that we're trying to do. Um, and there's a number of different superconducting materials out there. Uh, the one that they use today in MRI machines is mostly something called niobium uh, titanium. Um, it's been around uh, since the 1950s. Uh, to, to reach its critical temperature, meaning to get it cold enough where it starts to superconduct, it has to get down to nine degrees Kelvin, which is, is very cold. Uh, and so typically what they do with these magnets is they will, they will put them in a bath of liquid helium, which is at four degrees Kelvin, uh, and uh, cool it down that way. The problem is that you have this big bath of liquid helium. You have about 1,000 liters of it. Um, and that's, that's quite a bit uh, to have, have around. And one of the big problems <clears throat> with having that much um, helium around is there's something called a magnet quench, uh, which happens. And that is where you get a small region here, uh, which for some reason suddenly becomes normal conducting. So superconducting means the current can go through it without generating any heat. But for some reason, there's a little spot that, that is defective or something for some reason and it heats up. Now it's acting like, like a copper wire, it's acting like a little piece of toaster, it's starting to heat up. As it heats up, it starts to warm the wires next to it. Those wires start to heat up, they lose their superconducting property and become resistive, and they start to heat up. And then you get more heat and it just, it kind of just um, goes very quickly and it spreads on the order of a tenth of a second to a second for this whole thing to kind of, kind of take off. Um, and what happens when you have that much, um, let's, uh, if I can get this. Uh, when, you, when you have this liquid helium and it suddenly heats up, um, let's see, oh, there we go. Uh, What you're seeing here is, uh, is a, a magnet. What you're seeing, you can't see the magnet. It's down underground. But what you're seeing here is a vent. Uh, and what's happening is that liquid helium is heating up and turning into a gas. Um, and when you take some liquid helium and heat it up to a gas, it expands by about a factor of 700. Uh, so you have what was a kind of nice compact fluid all of a sudden wants to be in this big uh, amount of gas and the pressures build up really high. And so you have no choice um, except to just let it vent. Otherwise, it's just the pressure is going to build up and the, and the magnet will explode from all the pressure. Uh, the sad part about it is, is when it's venting like this, the helium is just going up into the air, into the atmosphere, and then we have no way of recovering it. It's gone forever. Uh, eventually it will, it's so light like a helium balloon, it will float into outer space. Um, uh, so that is um, a concern, especially since uh, helium is a natural resource and uh, limited supply. Uh, so one of the things that we are trying to do um, in our work is to go back and think about a different type of superconducting material. 
Uh, I won't go through all of these now since we're running a little late, but the one that we in particular are working on is something called magnesium diboride. Uh, so it's, it's similar to um, uh, the idea, which, where did it go here? It's, it's similar in, in uh, the niobium titanium um, in that it becomes superconducting, but you only have to get it down to 39 degrees Kelvin instead of nine degrees. So you don't have to get it down quite as cold. Uh, and that has an advantage because what we are trying to do um, is uh, take this magnesium, this kind of shows a cross section of the wire with the magnesium diboride in here which carries, carries the current. And we're trying to make a magnet that instead of bathing the whole thing in liquid helium, we have a little cryo cooler here, which will have about a liter or two of liquid helium compared to the thousand or so uh, of magnets today. Um, and what this cryo cooler does, would, it would get cold, and then these are copper straps here, and that copper straps would carry the, the heat away from the magnet and get this magnet down to about 10 degrees Kelvin. So the idea is with this conduction cooling, um, instead of having to bathe the whole thing in thousands of liters, we'll have a couple liters. I, I kind of compare this to taking your beer and trying to cool it in a cooler of ice, uh, and at the end of the day, you dump the ice in the water and it's gone, versus taking it and putting in the fridge, where you have a compressor that just kind of keeps running. Um, and so that's our, that's our goal for our particular group, is to try to use this new type of superconducting wire, along with this idea of conduction cooling uh, to, to not completely reduce, but to, to mostly get rid of the use of the, the liquid helium and save that natural resource. Uh, what we've gotten to the point now where we actually have built a coil and we're gonna be testing it at Ohio State. Um, uh, keep our fingers crossed that it, that it will work the way we expect. Um, but that's kind of uh, my own particular set of research and where things might head in the future. Uh, so just to kind of conclude, I think, you know, the, the kind of three things that um, uh, sort of leave you with is, uh, you know, we talked about that there's a lot of interest in MRI, a lot of new imaging techniques. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see where those go in the next decade and, and what we can learn about the brain. Um, that MRI is, is the, the, the basic idea is actually fairly simple. We just listen for the precession of, of protons, um, uh, at least the very basic concept. Implementing that, of course, it takes a while. And then uh, the idea that to make these big magnets, we can't just use regular copper wire. We have to use this superconducting material that we have to, to cool to very low temperatures. And presently they use uh, liquid helium for that. And one of our goals is to try to build a new type of magnet that has uh, um, less, less helium in it. So I'll leave it, leave it there. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.